to campaign on and to run on because the economy is is working well so far at least on paper because uh, the the administration can tout job creation at least on paper uh, it does raise the question about if voters feel okay about the economy, do they now pay closer attention to the people in charge? Do they pay closer attention to these scandals? Does it free up their minds a bit to, to make this an important issue to them? Or, um, or do they not care at all? Or Which is what right. I think the president is sort of hoping for. Right. Um, just to give us a, a few more details about uh, Acosta resigning. Um, apparently, uh, President Trump uh, came out uh, of the uh, White House with uh, Acosta by his side. He said that the labor secretary was a great labor secretary, and the president said that he hated to see this happen. Acosta, uh, for his part, uh, said that his resignation would be effective in seven days, and that he did not think that the way he handled the Epstein case should, should distract from his work as Secretary of Labor. And, um, and the quote is, my point here today is we have an amazing economy and the focus needs to be on the economy and job creation, which is what uh, Caitlin Huey Burns, what you were saying, that I'm sure that's what the entire administration hopes people do, that they forget about these scandals. Um, but maybe if the economy is great and everyone has jobs, then they start to look at the scandals. Right. And and when Acosta gave that the press conference, opera. he was directing that press conference to the president. Mm. And we've seen other cabinet secretaries do this or other people in the president's orbit take to the media, take to television to try to make their case in front of that audience of one. This is a signal that the president did not approve of that. Otherwise, as Zeke mentioned, he has shown a propensity to keep people in positions, uh, make, you know, allow them to stick it out. Mm -hmm. uh, tried to change the conversation yesterday with that executive order on the census. Um, Acosta in that press conference was not apologetic about his record. He uh, did not apologize directly to the victims and said he instead he said, come forward, come continue to tell your story. Well, a lot of those victims said we tried at the time and justice was not served. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about in the last hour, this is a story uh, that has multiple layers and that affects people at a, at a very visceral, negatively visceral level. Um, this is a story about injustice. This is a story about uh, women uh, tr mistreated um, to the fullest extent by people in power. And um, a lot of these issues that we've been talking about on the campaign trail, which are these issues of inequality, issues of a, a system that does not work for everybody, that advantages uh, people like Epstein. And so this had multiple layers to it, and I think this was a story that was not going to go away. I think Acosta realized that, uh, and given the coverage of that press conference, it was not favorable to him. Mm -hmm. So, Zeke, uh, I've just been researching this because I, I am really intrigued by the number of staff turnovers that have uh, occurred at the White House going back to uh, January of 2017. Um, and according to a report that I'm reading from the New York Times, uh, the, this White House has a record for the highest turnover within a single department going back to Michael Flynn, forced out over conversations with the Russian ambassador, James Comey, fired by President Trump. Uh, you've got uh, Sean Spicer, who resigned after the Scaramucci uh, thing. Scaramucci himself <laughs> Resigned. And, and was there for, uh, a, for uh, like a day or a couple yeah. of days, right? <laughs> uh, Ryan's Priebus replaced by Mr. Kelly. Steve Bannon pushed out when Kelly became uh, the chief of staff. Um, Tom Price, if you recall, he was forced out for traveling on private jets. Carl Higby, he resigned over racist comments. Um, the list goes on and on, and those are some of the higher profile names. I mean, there's dozens of people. Rex Tillerson, Fired via, t via Twitter by President Trump. That was the Secretary of State. Um, uh, Hope Hicks. Uh, no, I, she, just left, she, she was not fired. She was not fired, yeah. but she, she announced her resignation in, in February of that year uh, that she left. Uh, Sessions, the Attorney General, fired by the President. Uh, the list just goes on and on and on. Uh, you know, um, Ryan Zinke for controversy. There's just a, a dozen and, and more of people, um, uh, Zeke, who are now gone from the White House. And it just, the, 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 I guess the question, and maybe the larger point that I'm making, is it increasingly seems as if the president is making unilateral decisions on matters of great importance to the American people, of national security, without a vetted, in the role of the United States Senate, of advise and consent, without a vetted group right. of cabinet officials that has been vetted and, um, uh, 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 has gone through that confirmation process, Completely. which is the Senate's role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a very tight circle of decision-making around the president, really structured around him. 
you know, when when the president came into office, there were really two there were two camps. There were the the aides who um, would not get a job in any other Republican administration. They were Trump people that the president brought in and had questionable, often questionable qualifications, questionable personal histories, and many of them have been, and sort of they were taking time bombs. They blew up over the course of this time period. Others were sort of traditional Republicans who would get a job in every other Republican administration, but they temperamentally clashed with the president over and over and over again, and many of them found their way out. Now we're sort of in this third camp of uh, uh, often folks who are, you know, the B or the C team in many cases, um, who have been able to keep their head down so they don't clash with the president, they're willing to take these sorts of jobs. But from the very beginning, during the, the transition back in 2016, the president has had trouble attracting high-quality uh, uh, staff, the people who could pass uh, ethical muster across the board, conduct themselves and run their departments effectively and efficiently, and bring the smart policy ideas that he wanted uh, into the administration. And part of that, part of that, was by design, the president wanted to be the hub in, uh, in, 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 this, in this wheel of government that he was that is going to turn around him. That's the vision of the presidency that he has, has come to have. Um, so, it, 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 you know, some of it is is it, neglect, some of it is inability to attract staff, or some of it bring, is bringing the wrong people. But fundamentally, this is the president's management style: is this sort of sense of chaos around him, where every every decision flows through him. He is the ultimate arbiter on those decisions. He doesn't really delegate very much, uh, unless it's the blame. Yeah, you know, it occurred to me as you were saying that, Vlad, that in some of the cases, certainly not all, but in some of the cases, there's sort of ample, ample warnings that this person was inappropriate, that there would be issues with ethics or violations. Everywhere, it was like a train that you could see coming, mm -hmm. and inevitably, you know, the predictions were fulfilled. Um, but I, I wonder, like, where we're going to go from here, Zeke, because it increasingly, increasingly seems like it's challenging for this White House to attract people. It was sort of, you know, somewhat of a challenge maybe initially, but not really. I mean, who doesn't want to work for the White House, right? right. But now it, it seems that many of the people who are qualified see what they're getting themselves involved in. Well, I mean, you've got, as Zeke, as you know, uh, somebody like the Attorney General William Barr, somebody who's had a fairly successful career in Washington, was a former Attorney General. And now because uh, you are increasingly finding a smaller pool of candidates, you find people who see, this is my shot. This is my shot. Right. I was perhaps put out to pasture. Uh, no one was talking about me. Uh, I wasn't on anybody's radar. Uh, but I did serve my country with some distinction, and I can come back and that role. And, but the thing about it is this also becomes your legacy. Right. I mean, what we're going to remember about Acosta is his departure from the White House versus all the work that came before. Mm -hmm. And you got to be willing to take that on as well. So, so we're exactly gonna, sorry, Zeke, one second. We're going to uh, have a CBS News special report, uh, which is going to be uh, happening in just a few seconds. So if we cut you off, um, we apologize for that. But mm -hmm. I'm just letting our audience know that that's coming uh, momentarily. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Anthony Mason in New York. President Trump announced a few minutes ago that his labor secretary, Alex Acosta, is stepping down. The two men appeared side by side outside the White House. Acosta had faced calls from Democrats to resign over his handling of a controversial 2008 secret plea deal with accused sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Here's what the president said a short time ago. He made a deal that people were happy with and then 12 years later, they're not happy with it. You'll have to figure all of that out. But the fact is, he has been a fantastic Secretary of Labor. And Alex called me this morning and he wanted to see me. And I, I actually said, well, we have the press right out here, so perhaps you just want to say it to the press. Uh, but I just want to let you know, this was him, not me, because I'm with him. He was a, he's a tremendous talent. He's a Hispanic man. He went to Harvard, a great student. And in so many ways, I just hate what he's saying now because we're going to miss him. But please, Alex. Thank you, Mr. President. Over the last week, I've seen a lot of coverage of the Department of Labor. And what I have not seen is the incredible job creation that we've seen in this economy, more than 5 million jobs. I haven't seen that workplace injuries are down, bucking a three-year trend. Workplace fatalities are down, bucking a three-year trend. That we had the safest year ever in mining, the lowest number of fatalities ever in mining. I have seen coverage of this case that is over 12 years old, that has input and vetting 
at multiple levels of the Department of Justice. And as I look forward, I do not think it is right and fair for this administration's Labor Department to have Epstein as the focus rather than the incredible economy that we have today. And so I called the president this morning. I told him that I thought the right thing was to step aside. You know, cabinet positions are temporary trusts. It would be selfish for me to stay in this position and continue talking about a case that's 12 years old rather than about the amazing economy we have right now. And so I submitted my resignation to the president, effective seven days from today, effective one week from today, earlier this morning. There is no need at all, as far as I'm concerned. I would have, I watched Alex yesterday. I thought Alex did a great job. And, you know, you can always second guess people and you could say it should have been tougher. They do it with me all the time. I make a great deal with anybody. And then they say, like the Democrats, oh, it could have been better. Paula Reed is at the White House now. Paula, just a, two days ago, Mr. Acosta said that he would not resign. What changed? And the next well, it appears that he was not able to continue fostering that goodwill will from the president. It was just a few days ago when the president. Yes, that's what people do. I just want to tell you, uh, this is a person that I've gotten to know. There hasn't been an ounce of controversy at the Department of Labor until this came up. And he's doing this not for himself. He's doing this for the administration. And Alex, I think you'll agree. I said, you don't have to do this. He doesn't have to do this. I do, and we have, we have, as everybody knows, we have Pat Pazella, who right now is a deputy, and he'll be acting for a period of time. I think you know Pat. He's a good man, highly recommended by Alex. Uh, but Pat is uh, going to be acting, and we've already informed him. Yes, and I did have a falling out a long time ago. Uh, the reason doesn't make any difference, frankly, but I haven't spoken to him in probably 15 years or more. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of Jeffrey Epstein, that I can tell you. And now, if you look, the remnants hurt this man, and I hate to see it happen. I will say this, and I say it again, and I say it loud and clear. Alex Acosta was a great Secretary of Labor. What he's done with plans, and you see the plans coming one after another. You're just about done with the 401k, and That's that correct. happened. Things that nobody would even think of. So it's very sad, but at the same time, he wants to focus to be on accomplishments, not on what you're talking about. Well, Alex believed that. I'm willing to live with anything, John. I think you know me. I've lived through things that, that you wouldn't believe. Um, Alex felt that way. And he also felt we're so good, we're doing so well. The economy, the stock market just hit the highest point yesterday in the history of our country. Our unemployment numbers are the best they've ever been. If you look at specifically certain groups, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, the best unemployment numbers in the history of our country. Uh, you know, there are so many good things, and he didn't want to distract from that. And I understand that 100%. Paul Ryan prevent you. Paul Ryan prevent you. Paul Ryan prevent you. Paul Ryan prevent you. For what? Paul Ryan prevent you from making any bad decisions. So Paul Ryan was not a talent. He wasn't a leader. When the people in freedom and, and great congressmen wanted to go after the Dems for things that they did very badly. He wouldn't give subpoenas, whereas Nancy Pelosi hands them out like they're cookies. Paul Ryan was a lame duck for a long time as Speaker. He was unable to raise money. He lost control of the House. The only success Paul Ryan had was the time that he was with me, because we got taxes cut, I got regulation cuts. I did that mostly without him. But for Paul Ryan to be complaining is pretty amazing. I remember a day in Wisconsin, a state that I won, 
where I stood up and made a speech and then I introduced him and they booed him off the stage, 10,000 people. So for him to be going out and opening his mouth is pretty incredible. But maybe he gets paid for that, who knows? Maybe he gets paid for that. So people come into our country illegally, we're taking them out legally. It's very simple. It's not something I like doing, but people have come into our country illegally. We're focused on criminals. We're focused on, if you look at MS-13, but when people come into our country, we take those people out and we take them out very legally. They all have papers and it's a process and I have an obligation to do it. They came in illegally, they go out legally. What the Democrats should be doing now is they should be changing the loopholes. They should be changing asylum. I've been talking to that, to you about this for a long time. They should be changing asylum. There's so many things. Now, let me, let me give you the good news. Mexico has done an outstanding job so far. If you look at the border, it's down now 30%, and that's only one week inclusive where they've gotten it together. The June numbers just came out. It's down. It looks like it's going to end up being a little bit above 30% down. It's going to be down more and more. They have 21,000, and I say 21,000 Mexican soldiers on the borders, both their southern border and our southern border. And we really have it in control. The problem is we have a big problem. The laws are so bad. The Democrats have to help us fix the immigration laws. But even with that, because of the job that Mexico's doing, and yes, they maybe did it because of tariffs, but they're doing a great job, and I appreciate it. No, no, who said, who said that? Look, anything you do, the Democrats will say it's not good. In the meantime, they had a disaster. They have these laws that are so bad, catch and release, and you look at the different laws, visa lottery, that was a Chuck Schumer law. It's a disaster, a lottery. You pick them out, a lottery. The Democrats have caused tremendous problems. What they've let China get away with. For years and years, China's been ripping us off. They're not ripping us off anymore. Right now, companies are fleeing China because of the tariffs. And right now, we're taking in billions of dollars. And by the way, our people are not paying for it. They're paying for it. They're paying for it by depressing their currency and they're putting a lot of money. Look, nobody's ever done what I've done with China, and that's fine. And we'll get along with China. But you know, when I see a guy like Biden, who's weak and ineffective, and everybody that knows him knows, he's a weak man, he's an ineffective man. President Xi laughs at guys like that. Now, with that being said, I would say this, President Xi, Putin, all of these guys go to bed at night and they pray that Joe Biden or somebody like him becomes president so they can continue to rip off our country. No, I had no idea. I had no idea. I haven't spoken to him in many, many years, but I, I did have no idea. I've already, I've already talked about the Epstein matter. I gave a press conference that, according to the media, was longer than any other cabinet official in this administration. You know, I, I will reiterate what I said previously. My point here today is we have an amazing economy. We have unemployment lower than we have seen literally in my lifetime. And the focus needs to be on this economy and on job creation, on a decreased fatalities in the workplace and in mining. And going forward, that's where this administration needs to focus, not on this matter. We are looking into it. The platforms are absolutely, in my opinion, 100 percent crooked. They discriminate against Republicans and conservatives. They're 100 percent dishonest. That's my opinion. And something's going to be done. 
But I can tell you from personal experience, I see it. I had something happen this morning. I won't tell you about it yet. But these platforms are 100 percent, they're 100 percent dishonest, please. I was not a fan of Jeffrey Epstein. And you watched people yesterday saying that I threw him out of a club. I didn't want anything to do with him. That was many, many years ago. It shows you one thing, that I have good taste, okay? Now, other people, they went all over with him. They went to his island. They went all over the place. He was very well known in Palm Beach. His island, whatever his island was, wherever it is, I was never there. Find out the people that went to the island. But Jeffrey Epstein was not somebody that I respected. I threw him out. In fact, I think the great James Patterson who's a member of Mar-a-Lago, made a statement yesterday that many years ago I threw him out. I'm not a fan of Jeffrey Epstein. Yes, yes. You know what? You know what? They came in illegally. They have to go out. We have millions of people standing on line waiting to become citizens of this country. They've taken tests. They've studied, they've learned English, they've done so much. It's, they've been waiting seven, eight, nine years. We have some waiting 10 years to come in. It's not fair that somebody walks across the line and now they've become citizens of the Well, I wish the British ambassador well. Some people just told me, uh, yeah, too bad, but they said he actually said very good things about me. He was sort of referring to other people. And I guess I quoted Lindsey Graham today. He said some things that were pretty nice from the British ambassador. But look, I wish the British ambassador well, but they've got to stop their leaking problems there, just like they have to stop them in our country. Oh, we're not giving warning. No, we're not giving warning. There's nothing to be secret about. Can I tell you what? There's nothing to be secret about. ICE is law enforcement. They're great patriots. They have a tough job. Nothing to be secret about. If the word gets out, it gets out, because hundreds of people know about it. It's a major operation. So if the word gets out, it gets out. It starts on Sunday, and they're going to take people out, and they're going to bring them back to their countries, or they're going to take criminals out, put them in prison, or put them in prison in the countries they came from. We're focused on criminals as much as we can How many before we do anything else. For instance, MS-13, very important. We're taking them out by the thousands. We've already been taking you know, We didn't stop this. We've been taking criminals out for the last year. These people have been here for many years, MS-13. We're taking them out by the thousands. We're getting them out. I think we'll have it in the end where it'll be actually more accurate than a census. Because we have information gotten through other means, whether you look at Social Security or other places. We have, including loan applications, we have information that's probably more accurate than the information we could get by going in and asking somebody, are you a citizen? A lot of people aren't going to tell the truth. No, no. Uh, not only didn't I back down, I backed up. Because anybody else would have given this up a long time ago. The problem is we had three very unfriendly courts. They were judges that weren't exactly uh, in love with this whole thing. And they were wrong. But it would have taken a long time to get through those courts. You understand that better than anybody, John. Would have taken a long time back up to the Supreme Court. So I asked, is there another way? And somebody said there's a way that might be better. It might be more accurate. They explained it. I said, then what are we wasting time? We're going to be in court for the next two years. What are we wasting time for? In the meantime, we have to, by law, have the printing done. So the printing has started, and we're already finding out who the citizens are and who they're not, and I think more accurately. So when I heard this, I said, I think that's actually better. I think what we're doing is actually better. 
and only the fake news, which there's plenty, would say different. No, he didn't let me know. These are great professionals. These are people that have done this for a long time. We're really looking for criminals as much as we can. We're trying to find the criminal population, which has been coming into this country over the last 10 years. We know who they are, too. We've been taking them out by the thousands, specifically gang members from MS-13 and other gangs. We've been taking them out by the thousands. So, so we are really specifically looking for bad players, but we're also looking for people that came into our country, not through a process, they just walked over a line, they have to leave. Some do. No, no, no. The mayors in sanctuary cities, like a mayor like de Blasio, who's probably the worst mayor in the country, from New York, I don't even know what his attitude is. Nobody does, because he doesn't work very hard. Nobody knows what the hell he does. But a guy like de Blasio probably wouldn't want the raid. Uh, but many mayors do. Most mayors do. You know why? They don't want to have crimes in their cities or states. What do you think about Christine Lagarde? What do you think about Christine Lagarde? What do you think about Christine Lagarde? So nobody has treated the military better than President Trump. Nobody. Nobody's even come close. And you see that with budgets, you see that with the pay increases, and you see that with medical. But you know where you see it more than any place is with the vets. Because the vets now have choice. They never had choice before. For 40, wait, wait, wait. For 44 years, wait, wait. For 44 years, we are looking at that. For 44 years, They've tried to get veterans' choice. I got it. Nobody else could have got it. Okay. Go ahead. Say it. Well, I think how many bites at the apple do you get? We've gone through 500 witnesses, 2,500 subpoenas. I've let them interview my lawyers. I've let them in because I had nothing to do with Russia. Now that's come out. There was no collusion. But how many, how many people and how many times, and this has been going on for two and a half years. Rush Limbaugh said there's nobody else in the world that he knows that could have taken it. And on top of taking it, I've been a great president. I've done more, listen, listen. I've done more in two and a half years than any other president. Nobody's even close, including, we just said, veterans I've got. But for two and a half years, so now they have Mueller go make a speech. That goes. Now they want it to have him again. They want to go it again and again and again because they want to hurt the president for the election because I see what I'm running against. You got sleepy Joe Biden. He doesn't have the energy to be president. And the people that are nipping on his heels, they don't have what it takes. And I can tell you that China and Russia, and I've been rougher on Russia than any president in the last 50 years, China and Russia and try North Korea, where I have a relationship. You don't have a man testing nuclear anymore. You have a man, wait, wait. You have a man that was so happy to see me. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. You have a man that doesn't smile a lot. But when he saw me, he smiled, he was happy. You have a man that when I came into office, all he was doing before under Obama was testing nuclear weapons and blowing up mountains. And now he's not doing it. There's nothing he can say. He's written a report. The report said no collusion, and it said effectively no obstruction because there's no obstruction. And the other thing is very interesting. So they find out there's no collusion. The whole thing is about collusion. So they find out it's no collusion. Now, actually, it was different. It was bad crimes committed by the other side. We'll find out about that. I'm sure that's being looked at right now. So, so, there's no collusion and there's no obstruction. Now, we have a great attorney general now. He's strong and he's smart. 
and he read it and he studied it along with Rod Rosenstein, who worked it from the beginning. And Rod Rosenstein and Bill Barr said there's no obstruction. It's also interesting. Number one, there's no crime. And how do you obstruct when there's no crime? Also, take a look at one other thing. It's a thing called Article 2. Nobody ever mentions Article 2. It gives me all of these rights at a level that nobody has ever seen before. We don't even talk about Article 2. So, they ruled no collusion, no obstruction. Very simple. And you can only, by the way, you can only get so many bites at the apple. We got to get on to running a country. You got immigration, infrastructure, drug prices. The Democrats aren't working. All they're doing is trying to hurt people like Alex Acosta, a man who has done, a man who, I have no idea. Are you a Democrat? I am not, no. I have no idea. You know what I know? You know what I know about Alex? He was a great student at Harvard. He's Hispanic, which I, which I so admire, because maybe it was a little tougher for him, and maybe not. But he did an unbelievable job as the Secretary of Labor. That's what I know about him. I know one thing. He did a great job. And, and, and until this came up, there was never an ounce of problem with this very good man. Go ahead. And, and let, me, let, let me just add, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just add, you know, I hear a lot about how individuals got jobs and whatnot. Before our interview, we had never met, we had never talked. The president selected me as it should be done. It wasn't that we knew each other, it's not that we had a long-standing relationship, and I think that's a testament to his selection process. What do you make of the infighting going on among Democrats and Congress? Well, I think Cortez, who kept Amazon out of New York, and they don't like her for that, thousands and thousands of jobs, I think Cortez is being very disrespectful to somebody that's been there a long time. I deal with Nancy Pelosi a lot, and we go back and forth, and it's fine. But I think that a group of people is being very disrespectful for her, to her. And you know what? I don't think that Nancy can let that go on. A group of people that came from, I don't know where they came from. I'm looking at this Omar from Minnesota. And if one half of the things they're saying about her are true, she shouldn't even be in office. But Cortez should treat Nancy Pelosi with respect. She should not be doing what she's doing. And I'll tell you something about Nancy Pelosi that you know better than I do. She is not a racist, okay? She is not a racist. For them to call her a racist is a disgrace. Yeah, and very importantly, today, in a few hours, Vice President Pence and the head of Homeland Security are taking the press and Congress people into detention centers. And we're the ones that said they were crowded. They are crowded because we have a lot of people. But they're in good shape. And the reason is because the fake news New York Times wrote phony stories. What Border Patrol is doing, they become nurses and janitors and doctors, and they're not trained for that. What they've done is so incredible. So they're touring detention centers, and that was my idea. Because I read a phony story in the New York Times today, or the other day, about the detention centers, about the conditions. And I had people calling me up at the highest levels from Border Patrol and ICE, almost crying about that phony story. And they never saw anything. They have phony sources. They don't even have sources. They write whatever they want. The New York Times is a very dishonest newspaper. They write what they want. And what they do is a tremendous disservice to this country. They are truly the enemy of the people. I'll tell you that. They are the enemy of the people. And what they wrote about detention centers is unfair. Now, I believe it's going to be the center they wrote about, but 
we're taking a tour. They are, I'd love to be there, but I'm going to Ohio, Wisconsin. I'll be going. I'll be going. But I've seen it. I've seen it. And these centers are, I mean, to have Ocasio say they're drinking out of toilets. She made that up, okay? That's a phony story. She made it up. And these people, they, I'll tell you what, I've been with ICE and I've been with Border Patrol a lot. They love those people coming across the border. They love them. And I've seen it. They love them. So one of the reasons the Democrats don't want to have a census is because the number of people in the United States for many years, you know, for years you've heard 11 million. It's far greater than that. But we'll find out because I'm going to do something much more accurate than the way we the way we did it in the census would never have been very accurate. What we're doing will be much more accurate. The wall is being built. The wall is being built. We had a couple of very good decisions. We had one bad decision. Uh, it's very tough. Again, Paul Ryan let us down. Paul Ryan was a terrible speaker. Frankly, he was a baby. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. The wall let us down. Now, in all fairness, the problem with, with during when we had both houses, in the Senate, you need 60 votes. Well, we don't have 60 votes. We had 51 last time. Now we have 53 because we won during the 18 election, which nobody wants to say, just so you understand. So the wall is being built. We had one setback. We had one tremendous victory. And I had a tremendous victory that was very rarely covered by the press. Two days ago, I won the emoluments case. That was the biggest case of them all. I won the emoluments case. People don't know that by being president, I lose billions of dollars by my being president, and especially in money I can't make because I don't do deals. But I lose billions of dollars. But another thing, I get a salary of 400 or 450 thousand dollars a year. I don't think any other president's ever given up. It's a lot of money, almost a half a million dollars. I give it up. I don't think I've ever seen anybody say I give up my salary. I'm not looking for credit, but I give up my salary. I get zero. I get zero. But you know what makes me happy? That we're doing a great job. And I want to thank Alex Acosta. He was a great, great secretary. I asked about a law. I asked about a law, not the law. Uh, Iran, better be careful. They're treading on very dangerous territory. Iran, if you're listening, you better be careful. Thank you. All right, you've been listening to uh, the president of the United States uh, on his way to Minnesota, I believe he mm -hmm. is, right. uh, on his way to Minnesota, and he's taking questions alongside the newly resigned Labor, Labor Secretary, Alex Acosta. Uh, so that is the news. Let's get into it. Uh, first, we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, I, well, no, actually, we're not at the top of the hour, but I was well, looking at can. that teleprompter. We can hey, say hello. This is Vlad. I'm Anne Marie Green. He's going to Wisconsin. He's I just got corrected. Okay, in my he's ear. going to Wisconsin. Um, right. But, uh, I, you know, Vlad, I don't know about you, but I thought what was I thought was really interesting about. Uh, his conversation there is that he repeatedly defended um, the labor secretary. Right. So here's what's going on. Um, just about an hour ago, the secretary of labor, Alex Acosta, uh, was announced that he is resigning from his post. And this all comes uh, over the cloud of controversy during his time as a prosecutor uh, in Florida. Uh, and the sweetheart deal is what some people are calling it that he gave to the financier Jeffrey Epstein, which allowed uh, Mr. Epstein to receive a very lenient sentence for uh, sexual uh, trafficking charges that yeah. were levied against him. Um, the president says that Alex Acosta called him last night and offered his resignation and that the resignation was Mr. Acosta's decision. He appeared alongside the president there uh, on the way to Marine One. 
And so what's really interesting is the president spent about an hour, 45 minutes or so, taking questions from reporters. So we've got a slew of people here to talk about this, including uh, Caitlin Huey Burns, who's a CBSN uh, political reporter, uh, Zeke Miller, who's an Associated Press White House correspondent and also a CBSN political uh, contributor, and Rebecca Royfe, who's an attorney. She's also joining us on the telephone. So I guess let me go to Rebecca first because she's new in this conversation. Um, Rebecca, let me start by asking uh, the labor secretary, the former labor secretary says that he got the best possible deal that he could possibly get. He says the times were different a dozen years ago and he thought that this was the best deal that he could get for the government. What's your response to that? What's your analysis of what Alexander, uh, Alexander Acosta was able to get uh, back in 2007? You know, I mean, I agree that the times were different back then, but um, this is really not, um, you know, a sort of workplace sexual harassment kind of issue where, you know, there's increased attention to an increased um, a sense of a need for accountability. This is a situation where it is clearly, you know, younger girls and sex trafficking and sex assault. I don't think those were ever treated with any kind of leniency. So I don't think that the that the different times can really can really um, account for the treatment. So he said that in his press conference, he also blamed local prosecutors and he blamed other people. That doesn't seem particularly. Um, uh, sort of um, pro professional way to deal with this either. So um, I'm interested that he finally decided to resign, and that must have been under a great deal of pressure. Caitlin, what do you make about, you know, how the president spoke about this? And he does sometimes have a tendency to <laughs> sort of first be critical, and then when, once the person is <laughs> out the door, you know, sort of lavish praise on them. But the conversation mm -hmm. we were having earlier is about how maybe he didn't have so many fans within mm -hmm. the administration. The president seems to still be one of them. Well, we remember that going into this, uh, we know that the president wanted uh, the labor secretary to give a press conference to defend himself uh, and his his um, dealings with this case several years ago. Uh, and when he did so, he was very defensive. Uh, he said that he made the best deal at the time. He would not apologize directly to the victim instead said those victims need to come forward. The victims were saying we did so and justice was not done. And again, that's why this story has so many layers and touches so many different people outside of politics because it's a story about uh, power, uh, corruption perhaps, and uh, whether justice is, is done to the fullest extent that it can be done. Um, but uh, appearing with him for it seems like a 40 minute press conference that turned out to be he was very defensive of Acosta and it raises the question about whether Acosta just felt like he could not uh, keep going in this capacity given the coverage of this. The story showed no signs of uh, slowing down. In fact, more victims have been coming forward, doing interviews, uh, talking about what they went through. Um, you also have the case, obviously, in New York. Again, this shows no signs of slowing down. And even with Acosta's departure, it doesn't show any signs of slowing down either. He says that, look, Acosta did a great job as a secretary of La the Labor Department. Uh, Acosta defended his work and said that this was just becoming a distraction. It was notable standing next to the president that he kind of bashed the press for its coverage. He said they're not covering the Labor Department. Instead, they're covering this case from, you know, a long time ago, as he put it. I don't think that will sit well with a lot of people, but this was uh, a defensive posture here, uh, seeming to acknowledge that this was just taking over um, and not going to end anytime soon. And Zeke, it almost sounded like he was sort of pinning the blame once again on the press and the Democrats for almost forcing Acosta out. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It, 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 it important to have the context of this decision. Um, you know, the, the pressure on, on Acosta over the last uh, two years has been building from Democrats on the presidential campaign on Capitol Hill. That uh, you know, that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, that, that's not necessarily the reason he left. You know, the, he has the he seems to have some of the president's support. But that was certainly uh, a contributing factor to the assessment by Secretary Costa. This story wasn't going away. It was going to make him an ineffective cabinet secretary. It was going to further uh, draw the ire of the president because it would keep him and this controversy in the news at a time when the president wants to, as you know, Acosta said, the president said he wants to be talking about the economy. He wants to talk about good news stories and not 
um, this terrible case of, uh, of, of abuse and, 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 and uh, you know, from a decade ago, uh, but that is now winding its way again as the pursuit of justice continues. Uh, Zeke, uh, while we've got you um, on the phone there, uh, we're being told, uh, multiple sources telling CBS News, uh, that Robert Mueller's hearing uh, may get pushed back to July 20. Fourth, but the negotiations are still fluid. And why I bring that up, uh, obviously, uh, the entire, you know, everybody was focused on next week when Mueller was supposed to testify before the House. But um, the president actually mentioned Robert Mueller in this freewheeling, I guess, impromptu press uh, conference um, where he again repeated no obstruction. No obstruction, right? Robert Mueller found no obstruction. Um, and again, part of the reason why the Congress wanted Mr. Mueller to appear is even with the understanding that Robert Mueller says that he would only testify to the things that are in the report, the no obstruction charge, that's not true. Here's what Robert Mueller wrote in the report. Our investigation, this is a quote, our investigation found multiple acts by the president that were capable of exerting undue influence over law enforcement investigations, including the Russian interference and obstruction investigations. The incidents were often carried out through one-on-one -on -one meetings in which the president sought to use his official power outside of usual channels. These actions range from efforts to remove the special counsel and to reverse the effect of the attorney general's recusal to the attempted use of official power to limit the scope of the investigation to direct and indirect contracts with witnesses with the potential to influence their testimony. The fact that Robert Mueller refrained from recommending prosecution is not the same as the president saying no obstruction. That's absolutely right. Uh, this has been a point of contention uh, since the initial summary of, uh, of the special counsel's findings were uh, released uh, three months ago by the Attorney General William, William Barr, a kind of ally and defender. Um, and just what Mueller said on the subject, he made very clear that. Uh, you know, his office had found out, uh, determined the president did not commit a crime there, they would have said so. Um, it was the Department of Justice, the president's political appointees, who said that they did not see enough evidence that would bring criminal charges against the president on the obstruction count. That, you know, that showdown, if it, whether it happens, is coming Wednesday or the Wednesday thereafter, um, if it is indeed delayed, uh, you know, will be a uh, political spectacle. Uh, both sides are certainly trying to make it so. Uh, but it will certainly also be a bad news day for the president. It will resurrect a controversy that Yes, he has rallied against it and rallied his base supporters against it, but it's a reminder of a, a very real period of legal jeopardy, but also um, the persistent questions around, uh, that, that, that follow him uh, regarding uh, his, his response to that initial, initial Russian investigation, and also what his administration is doing to prevent, it, prevent Russian meddling from happening in the next election. So the president doesn't want to be talking about that issue. He wants to be talking about the economy. He wants to be talking about the USMCA, uh, that new, new NAFTA trade deal, which is one of the reasons why he's coming to Wisconsin today. He's only be talking about those other issues, and they just keep finding a way to stay in the news. And you know that's why um, why I have to have to leave because he, he, he keep distracting the president from his, from his message, and that's why the president is sort of dreading uh, the Mueller testimony day, whatever day it is, and had originally scheduled a rally to be held that night so he can try to counter program it. And uh, so we curious to see whether or not he reschedules his rally and match that Mueller day as well. So, Zeke, you know, Vlad mentioned that uh, the negotiations for um, Mueller's appearance continue, and one of the concerns was the format of this um, hearing, that only 22 members of the committee were going to be permitted to speak, which means that some members were not going to get an opportunity. I know sometimes, you know, with these hearings, they become um, very partisan and uh, opportunities for some of the members to essentially showboat a little bit. But I'm wondering if you know, if you have any reporting on this, if you know which side is limiting the number of um, lawmakers that can question uh, Mueller. Is it coming from Mueller or is it coming from the committee? I, I don't uh, mm -hmm. have that reporting right now. Um, but it, 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 as you, it, you know, I mean, there has been a lot of time over just how long the, the time, the, how much time lawmakers have. And that would, uh, and given the, the fact that the Mueller is trying to appear in front of two committees on the same day, uh, just, you know, does create issues in terms of how many members on these large committees. Um, you can't can ask questions, and so as they try to ha you know haggle out the details there over the next couple of days, and whether or not they have to lose testimony as a result of it or not, you know, the underlying facts facts will still be the same. Uh, you know, this will be a special counsel testifying in, 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 in open sessions that will face questions from Democrats who are trying to get him to go beyond the report or 
uh, say what he said in the report again. It is in the report publicly in a way that would be embarrassing for the president and beneficial for them politically. I'm sure Republicans would be an option for them to try to highlight the parts of the report they believe are exculpatory for the president, but also uh, take the president in the process of white and potentially try to undermine the credibility of the special counsel. It will be a part of the food fight no matter what happens and whichever change it takes place, and no matter how many uh, lawmakers 